I'm Dave Holmes here at Knox United Church in Calgary. Uh, this is for Trinity Sunday, but I'm aware of all of the race protests happening here in Calgary and all over the world, uh, and uh, something needs to be said. Something needs to be said by white church leaders like myself, uh, and most especially something needs to be done by those of us who are benefiting from the racist system of which we are a part. Um, I am far from an expert in this, uh, but my hope is with this sermon to further a conversation that will lead to learning in my community and hopefully into action. Um, here is the scripture with which I am working. It's from the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. I, I don't know much about George Floyd. Apparently he was a church guy, quite involved. There's an article about him in Christianity Today about urban ministry work he was doing in Houston before he moved. People liked him at his workplace. He was engaged to be married, I think. What we all know is that he was arrested on suspicion of passing a bad $20 bill. Four officers were involved in the arrest, one of whom had him down on the street with his hands cuffed behind him while the officer kneeled on his neck for almost nine minutes while George pleaded with the officer saying, please, I can't breathe. Gradually, as the officer continued to kneel on his neck, George became quiet and then he became still and still the officer kneeled on his neck. He died in hospital shortly afterwards. Contrast that with the way police treated an angry, aggressive, heavily armed mob of white people who stormed the state capitol in Michigan and shut down its business for the day. I'm not necessarily criticizing what police did there, just noticing. Why the difference, do you think? I was in Fish Creek once when a father lost track of his little boy. The kid was on a bike, you know how it is. One second he was right there, and the next he was gone. Everybody was looking, running down this path and that. The police were out, bicycles and vehicles. There was a raft in the river. It turned out well. Police found the little boy. Great response. Contrast that with the stories of the missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls in their hundreds. No, we'll wait a few days. She'll probably just show up somewhere. Why the difference? Why is a black person 40 times more likely to be shot by police than a white person in Toronto? Why are so many prison inmates indigenous? when they are such a small portion of the population? Why is almost everyone in Canada that has no access to safe drinking water living on a reserve? Why is the Northeast in Calgary seen as a less desirable place to live? You know and I know that I could go on and on. You know and I know that the more research I do or you do, the more facts anyone marshals, the more statistics at which we look, the worse it gets. So the problem is not white supremacists, if we mean by that people who wear swastikas and shout blood and soil. They're a problem for sure, but they're a pretty small minority. The problem is that we live in a white supremacist society. The problem is that we live in a white supremacist system, a system that consistently privileges white people and consistently puts down everyone else. The problem is not this 
bad cop or that bad cop. It's not a bad president. It's not even law enforcement or the Indian Act. It's the system of which all of these things are component parts. And it's the pretense that many of us white folks have that simply being nice and relatively unprejudiced people is enough. It isn't. Because just being nice leaves the system unacknowledged and unchanged. If the society of which I am a part consistently privileges me over people of color and I am not doing something concrete to change that, I am part of the problem and not part of the solution. No matter how nice I am and no matter how hard I try not to be personally prejudiced. A friend, the Reverend Anthony Bailey, reminded me in a radio interview that the whole concept of race was really invented in the 17th and 18th centuries to justify colonial expansion in the slave trade. Apparently you can read this kind of stuff in the philosophy of people like Immanuel Kant, that there is a hierarchy of races. At the top, of course, whites, then Orientals, perhaps, and so forth, down to the bottom of the heap, which would be occupied by the blacks. This hierarchy is a lie, of course. Genetically, there's really no difference. If I need a kidney transplant and a black person offers me their kidney, my body won't know the difference. I would hesitate a long time before saying that Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Oprah Winfrey, Malala Yousafzai, were representatives of lesser races. But still, that hierarchy of races, that lie, is a part of the mental architecture on which our society sits. Why is a multiracial community deemed less safe and less desirable than a mostly white area? Because the other races are deemed less than. We may not consciously believe that. We may not want to believe that. But our society and our real estate values are structured on that belief. Our laws, our law enforcement, our economics and social systems, our attitudes and assumptions are based on a lie dreamed up to support the slave trade. How does that feel? It's not just some policeman who killed George Floyd. It's the lie about race that killed George Floyd and literally countless others like him. Let me switch views for a minute. There's another hierarchy in place, particularly for us in the church. It's a hierarchy of religions. Our scripture today contains the passage called the Great Commission, the mission of the church in the minds of many, go and make disciples of all nations. That has been understood as a called conversion Go and make Christians of absolutely everybody. That call is based on a mental hierarchy. Christianity is at the top. Maybe Judaism next, because, you know, I guess Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> then Islam, maybe, because they're people of the book, and then all the rest. But Christianity at the top. All the other religions are less than, just like all the other races are less than the white race. Is that religious hierarchy true? Or might that be a lie too? It sure has caused a lot of suffering in the world, especially when it has been combined with the hierarchy of race. Residential schools are just one example. For that matter, in this church, we can name some other toxic hierarchies because we've been looking at them. Men over women, straight over gay, cisgender over queer, rich over poor, beautiful over plain, whatever the heck beauty is supposed to be. Looking at the mental architecture of our society, this is what I think I see. Up at the surface, you have the laws and customs and habits. These are supported by common attitudes and thinking. And underneath, there are some core beliefs. And a lot of those core beliefs are lies. They are toxic hierarchies. And as long as conversion therapy is a thing, and as long as property values in a multi-ethnic community are lower, 
As long as black ministers have a hard time getting jobs in the United Church, those toxic hierarchies are in full force. Why do we have millions marching in the streets time and time again since the Civil Rights Movement and still nothing fundamentally changes? Because those toxic hierarchies are powerful, well protected, and unchallenged by people like you and me, people who benefit from them. The picture in this scripture is actually, actually a pretty pathetic one. Here's poor resurrected Jesus gathered with his little congregation of 11 down from 12 the week before. And even that group is not totally with him. Some doubt. Some, not one, not just Thomas, some. All authority, Jesus says, but there's no real power here, it looks like. No privilege. He says to his doubting 11, go and make disciples. Disciples not believers, not members of a religion, disciples, people who learn, people who learn to be as Jesus was, people who learn and follow Jesus' teachings. Love God with your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Tell me, he said, who is a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves, the one who showed compassion? Well, go and do likewise. Now, how do you make disciples? I took a bunch of spiritual formation courses last year, and all the research says that religion, spirituality, is caught more than taught. As children, we watch how our parents practice their faith. We watch how they live their lives, and we absorb it. We grow into the family resemblance. We meet a teacher that res inspires us, and it's, it's like we catch their enthusiasm. It's not just what they say, it's not just what they teach. It's who they are and what they do. Religion is caught more than taught. So we make disciples, I think, by being disciples. A society's attitudes are caught more than taught. So we make change by being the change, at least in part. The death of George Floyd has once again ripped the cover off of our society's mental architecture and shown the lies that our society is built upon. I believe those lies are our business in the church, and we are sent to challenge the lies. Now, without question, the police are part of the problem, and policing needs to change. But I don't think we should be blaming the police for this. Condemning this group or that group for their racism or sexism is a way of pretending that the problem resides with others. And I firmly believe that the problem needs to be owned by nice, well-meaning people especially. Every person who benefits from the racism of our society needs to own the problem. And the only way I know to change and challenge the lies is to become a learner, to encourage others to learn, to put into practice what we have learned to Je from Jesus, to stop living out the lie of hierarchy and start living out of the truth of neighbor, of service, and common humanity, to start living connection. In three days, the United Church of Canada will turn 95, our motto is still pretty relevant, that all may be one. Or in Mohawk, Agwe Nyadede Wa Neren, which means all my relations. That's what we need right now. So here's my call for us today. Let's get out there and be disciples, learners, people who shape their lives on the teaching of Jesus. It takes some humility to learn, and we're going to have to learn from particularly some of Jesus' disciples here. We need to uh, read a book or two, maybe. White Fragility, Waking Up White, Dear Church. We need to listen to the leaders of the black church and the indigenous church and learn from them. We need to learn from indigenous elders and leaders. This is Indigenous History Month, here in Alberta, in Canada, 
and the newsletter yesterday had information on some webinars and indigenous church that indigenous church leaders are offering take some of those in practice the core teaching of Jesus to love one another that all may be one all my relations and let's go and make disciples too let's invite others to learn with us Encourage each other so that we can keep going, even when our learning makes us uncomfortable. Because here's the wonderful part. That doubting group of 11, with no visible power or privilege, that little group of learners on the way, they kind of did turn the world upside down. Because as Jesus told them, I will be with you. Ministers come and go. Jesus stays with us. And ultimately, Jesus is the one we learn from and follow. So go make disciples, starting with ourselves. And let's invite others to join us. Let's go learn. And society will be transformed. Amen.